if I could go back and do it all over again, would I change the way I have run this company? Hmm. This might be an uncomfortable podcast for some of you to hear, but let's dive in. I'm Christy Code Red, and you're listening to Rebel Weight Loss and Lifestyle, where we believe food holds the power to heal or poison, and we believe our society has been misled regarding proper nutrition and weight loss. You're in the right place if you're looking for some straight up truth, because I'm here to shed light on the lies and brainwashing that has taken place over the past five decades. Thanks so much for listening. Welcome back to another episode of Rebel Weight Loss and Lifestyle. I'm your host, Christy Code Red, author, entrepreneur, retired professional boxer. And um, I have debated, I've been thinking about this podcast for a while now. Of course, you know, my podcast, Rebel Weight Loss and Lifestyle, we've done over 270 episodes over the past many years. I've never missed one week. Uh, I've never, I've never missed one week. I've never missed, uh, uh, an, you know, a lot of, I'm trying to think of the, the word for it when you, uh, a, a download, I've never missed a, you know, you've never, I, and I know so many people who do podcasts and they take these long breaks and they're inconsistent. And I always laugh at people when they say they want to start a podcast. Cause this is the most difficult part of code red. It is coming up with different ideas. And I've had this idea on my heart for a while. Um, and I debated on whether I should talk about it but I'm always authentic. And I think I do things in a classy way. And I think that even I can take a cringy subject and still make it, um, a, you know, enjoyable to listen to. And, and hopefully you learn something. I mean, not every single podcast out of 270 plus is going to be a home run or it might not resonate with you and every single one, but that's just the way that I've done it with rebel weight loss and lifestyle over the years. So I'm going to keep up with that. And today we're talking about the top three things I would change if I were to start code red over again, if I could go back and do it over, would I do anything different? Would I change some things? I think you're going to be surprised at what you hear from me. Um, uh, in fact, I know you are because I think that people, think, well, the opinion, it's always funny who, who's got opinions of a multi-million dollar company when you ain't got a multi-million dollar company, you ain't even even run a company before. And then you've got opinions of the way I do things. That's always funny to me. Cause uh, you know, I, I would never try to advise some, someone on something that I don't know anything about. And so I'll, I'll get, I'll get plenty of different types of comments and you're always welcome to comment. If you want, it's a free country, you have your first amendment rights and I'm not going to stop you, but I probably won't put a lot of stock in your opinion, unless you run a bigger company than me. But nevertheless, here are my top three things that I would change. If I were to go back and do it over knowing now, would I change things? Yes. There are three things I would do different. There might be more, but I had a hard time thinking of three. Um, and that, that is that arrogant that I, there aren't a lot of things I would change. I don't think it's arrogant. I just think that, um, you know, I've made a lot of mistakes. I'm not saying I haven't made a lot of mistakes. I made a lot of mistakes, but, um, fundamentally there are three things that I would do different. Now I have been doing, I've been in the health and fitness industry since 1994. So that's 30 years at the time that I'm recording this. Um, I have been doing code red for 14 years, but I've been doing code red like the way that, you know, for eight years, I hit my first million. I took my company from food stamps to the first million. And I hit my first million in 2017. And then I started doing 10 million a year, starting three years later. So 2000, I did, uh, 2018, 19 and 2020 were really big years for code red, really big revenue years. And then it started slowing down after the lockdowns in 2020. And we went through some personnel changes and a lawsuit and a couple of different things where, um, just some changes. 
And it takes a lot. If you're doing a million a month in revenue, it takes a lot to keep a company that size going. Um, it takes a lot of personnel. It takes a lot of, you got a lot of books to have to keep your eye on. And it takes a lot of revenue. It takes a lot of capital to keep a company like that going. You don't get to keep, you know, you're talking about a, you know, a 48%, 46%, 43% profit margin. You're not keeping all that money. So, um, like Biggie says, more money, more problems. But uh, I have definitely taken Code Red down a notch, but I've automated a lot of things and I've designed the company nowadays to be exactly what I like and exactly what I want and to best suit my needs and, and make it to where I'm not quite so stressed out or unhappy. Uh, every single day of my life, I'm happy. Every single day I live my life um, according to what makes I, I do what makes me happy. I, um, the, everything I do makes me happy. There's nothing I do that I dread or I don't like. Um, I know I make jokes about this podcast only because it's like a hungry beast that you can never satisfy. It's all, you're always needing to upload new episodes and record new episodes. So it is stressful to come up with new episodes, but I don't do anything stressful anymore in my life. I don't have stress. I don't have drama. I don't have stress. I don't have gossip. I don't, I don't keep people that are toxic around me. I just don't do it. And that's a lot of things that I've changed. I have brought my staff down to a skeleton staff. Everybody gets paid well, everybody works really hard. So the way I run things now is different than the way I wrote, ran them in 2017, 18, 19, and 20. I took everything down a notch in 2021, 22, 23, 24. So my whole point in saying all that is I think I'm qualified to uh, give business advice. I'm qualified to, I've been doing this long enough and I've gone through so many different changes. And this is a very saturated industry that few people can make it in. You know, only 1% of entrepreneurs even make over a hundred grand a year. Um, so it's, it's unusual. I mean, there are, there, there's a reason why I have earned these awards and these accolades and these different, um, these different magazines I've been in and these different stages I've spoken on is cause I've been through the fire and I have continued to rise above. And so I, um, and I say that respectfully and humbly, I'm so incredibly grateful to be where I am. And I love business. I love talking about business. I love planning business. I love coming up with new ideas. I love planning out new programs. I love building them out. I love presenting them. I love sales. I really love what I do. And I love code red more than anything. The brand will always be put first. The brand will always, we, the brand comes first. Uh, no matter what, we always respect the brand and we will always push that to the front of the line. Um, and we will sacrifice what we have to in order to keep the brand alive and, and maintain the integrity of the brand. So three things that I would change if I were to go back, knowing now, if I knew back then what I know now, what would I do different? Number one, I wouldn't hire family. Now, <laughs> when you first start a company, you first start a business, sometimes family is all you can get to work for you because they're the ones who believe in you and they're willing to work for free or work for really cheap. Uh, and, um, that is just kind of how it happens. And you're always grateful. Like you're grateful for your parents and you're grateful for, you know, you hire your brothers and sisters and you hire your uncle and you hire different people in your family to do things that, um, that maybe nobody wants to do, or maybe they don't, you don't even know if you're, you're, this is even going to work. Like you came up with something and you're producing it in your garage and you don't even know if you're going to be able to keep it going. But so your family is the ones that'll be like, yeah, I'll work for you for a month. And then of course, if it doesn't work out, then, you know, you can, you don't have to worry, but it's dangerous with when you hire family. Now I have hired every single member of my family at some point and everybody's worked for me at some point. Um, and it has, except for my mom who works for me right now and, and has worked for me, uh, in various facets right now, she's running our shipping department. Um, it has always turned bad. It has always turned bad. Um, and it's, it's now I did hire my drug addict sister, but, and she was sober at the time. And that's why things I did hire her and she did a pretty good job, but she never did get help for her, uh, her addiction 
and she never went through AA and she never, she, she's never gone through a sobriety program and she doesn't, she doesn't, she's not sober now. And she's not, she uses on a regular basis now. And she, so when she started back up using, that's when I had to fire her. And she's always had bad feelings towards me because of that. Um, even though, I mean, can you blame me? You know, I mean, you know, so and the problem with hiring family is you can't have that hard conversation with them. I, I, I just see that you can't, um, it, there's, there's always going to be that, that edge, that something there that you might or might not be able to push past. And, and it happened with my sister, Carrie, you know, I knew she was unhappy with, with her, with her job. I knew that she was unhappy with, with shipping. She had taken over shipping. I knew she didn't like to do it. I knew she didn't want to do it. And it reflected because when you don't want to do something and it becomes a dread dreadful to do it, uh, it, it shows up in your work and I should have, I, and I tried, I tried to have that hard conversation with her, but it was such a hard conversation that never went anywhere. And I have never seen I have never been able to get through these hard conversations with family members without it ruining a relationship. And I've tried different methods. I've tried email. I've tried to talk. I've, uh, I've tried to, I've just not, maybe because I'm so direct, maybe because I mean, the customer always has to be taken care of and to keep a family member on staff just because you feel sorry for them or just because they're struggling, even though their work is crappy. I'm not saying this about my sister, Carrie. I'm just saying that I'm just in general, I'm just generalizing. Um, you can't keep family members on the payroll if they're not taking care of your customer. You can't let your company suffer because you feel sorry for somebody. You know, I had an employee that did not, I paid her through a certain date and she did not complete her job through that date. So I pulled her funds from her. She does not, I, I had already paid her. I knew I just, she, you know, she, she had, um, she was paid through a certain date and I found out she never showed up. So I pulled those funds back out of her account. I just don't have, I mean, look, you, you I will pay you for your job, but don't try to steal from me because then I will come after you. You can't, don't mess with my company. Don't mess with my company, you know? And and I think a lot of people will uh, try to keep family members on payroll and try to make it work, even though they are um, not good for the customer. They're not good for the company. They're not doing their job. They're making major mistakes. And you can't let that happen. You will damage your brand. You will damage your relationship with your customer. And eventually people will stop buying your product because they don't trust you. Also, the other staff members are walking on eggshells because they can't be honest about the family member. You know, the family member screwing up. Everybody's covering up for it. I mean, it's, it becomes a really sore spot for the other staff members who are now afraid to say something because that's your brother or, well, that's your Uncle Bob. And nobody wants to say anything bad against your Uncle Bob who's screwing up on his job. And everybody's having a cover for Uncle Bob. You know, and I just don't, I have not seen it work out with a lot of people. And I, I didn't, it didn't work out with me and it ruined my relationship with my sister, Carrie, it ruined it. And it'll never be the same. We'll never be, we'll never be friends again. We'll probably never be sisters again. We haven't spoken for a very long time. That will never happen. And I, and I know that a lot of you guys are listening to this and, and it's, it's sad, but because there were things that were said and done against my company. That is a, you do not do that. You do not come after someone's livelihood. And so that ruined our relationship and it could have been avoided. We could have just been sisters. And I would advise you to, to, to not hire family members. It just puts, it's too, it, it it's really hard to mix family and business. Now I'm, I seem to be able to do it. Okay. With my mom, we, we seem to have a great relationship. She does a great job at her job, but I can somehow have these hard conversations with her. Um, you know, she doesn't, we, I don't know how we're navigating it pretty well. Now I will say though, that I'm watching it closely 
And the second I see that something's not going right, um, I'm stepping in and I will, I have kind of made a promise to myself that if things start to go badly with her position, I will step in and change it. And the difference I think with being able to make, make it work with my mom is that, um, she is close by, she runs our shipping department. I am 30 minutes away from the shipping warehouse and the ship shop, we call it. And I am keeping my finger on the pulse of everything. So it's almost like we're doing it together. We do the Friday ship show um, and we do everything together. We order inventory together. We do counts together. Uh, we order supplies together. Everything is done together. And so we're really close on everything. And, and she, she takes her time and she checks and double checks and triple checks everything before it gets shipped out. And so she's very, very, very careful and very grateful for her job. Um, and I know that she really wants to do a good job, but I'm also keeping an eye on everything she's doing just because I don't want it to turn bad. So that's the last family member that I have working for me. And it's almost like we're, we're partners. We're, we're not partners, but we're almost like we're working together on this task, um, of trying to make sure that inventory is managed and shipments are shipped quickly and efficiently and we don't get misshipments and we don't make mistakes and we don't have people like you know, the other day I made a big mistake. You know, I, somebody ordered a bundle of three metabolic assist and I'll be gosh darn if I didn't turn around and ship them three D threes. And I, and it was me cause I'm the one that initialed the packing slip and it was totally me. So she has not made a mistake in like a month. It's been me, I, me and Brian, Brian and I have made mistakes. So I think that's the only way, but I have a plan set up in, in uh, plan B in case things don't go well with my mom. Uh, and she's just really good. She loves her job. She takes her time. She, she cares a lot. Um, and she is getting very, very, very familiar with the system. Now that we've been shipping since February 20th of 2024 and now February, March, April, May, it's been almost three months. So, cause I'm recording this in May of 24. So I, I, I we're making it work, but I would go back and I just would not hire family members because it does, if something goes wrong, it can ruin your relationship and now I, I don't have a relationship with my, either one of my sisters and I never will again. And it's sad. I've lost both of my sisters. I do not have sisters now. And it's, it's sad. I'll probably see them someday, probably at my dad's funeral. You know, I mean, that's probably, that's probably it. And it's re it's really sad because I miss them and, but it's, it's done. And I don't want to see that for you. I would, I would really would. I really think you should separate family and business. And I know that people have jokingly said family and business don't mix. And, and I tell you, I, um, not so very long ago, I was the person that says, oh, you can make it work. You can make it work. But I now looking back, I don't think you can make it work because when it comes to that really hard, just that hard conversation or talking about pay or, you know, if it, it's just man, when there are hurt feelings there, some nasty things can get said. And then, and then what, and you've got a ruined relationship. And if you're like me, you don't make the same mistake twice and you learn once and you don't, I don't really give second chances. Once, once someone crosses over into that, um, they cross that line and they do something that is unforgivable. That's it for me. I mean, I just don't, I don't, I don't, I don't, that's it. I, they're dead to me. I just am that way. It's, it's done. And that's sad. That's sad. So I would definitely suggest if you have a company, if you're starting a business that you don't do the family thing, that's one that I wish that I would have, um, not ever done. And like I said, when I first started out, I desperately needed the, and, and family members can help out, but actually putting them on the payroll, it's a tough one. That's a tough one be very careful. And if I could do it over again, I never would have gone on, down that road. Number two, the second thing I would change if I were to do it over again would be, and this is going to sound really cra crazy, um, on the heels of the first one, but they don't really go hand in hand. Believe me when I say this, 
The second thing I would do would be I would fire people quicker. Yes, I would fire people quicker. And that has nothing to do with family. I'm not saying like, like what? What are you talking about, Christy? I've had a lot of employees and a lot of subcontractors. And you know, business owners, you know when someone needs to be let go. You know, then the saying is slow to hire, quick to fire. Slow to hire, quick to fire. And I could not agree with this more. And I would have, I would have feeling, I would have that feeling that that person needs to go. I would have a feeling that they are not happy because when someone gets unhappy with their job, they just turn toxic and that toxic, that toxicity can spread pretty quick in your organization. And it, then they're having conversations offline behind your back in separate groups and they're scheming and they're gossiping and things can turn quick. They can turn, it can turn nasty really quick. The second you feel like this person needs to be fired, you need to let them go. I had two employees that were family members and one of them needed to go. I caught her, I caught her lying. I caught her uh, doing a couple of things that were against her contract, but her family member was a very vindictive, nasty person that I knew I would have problems with if I let the other one go, her, her, uh, you know, her family member. And so I didn't want to let the one go because I didn't want to have trouble with the other one because I saw how vindictive she was and I knew she'd be hateful and I knew it would be nasty. So I kept the, I kept the one on staff for a year longer than she needed to be just to keep on the good side of the other one. And I'm telling you, it was a, it was a circus to try to ju juggle and it was, you know, it was nasty. And that toxicity just grew in the organization. You need to cut that out of your business. As soon as you get the feeling that someone needs to go, you need to let them go. And that's why you always want to have systems in place to be able to fill that position and get someone else in there to pick up the slack. And I've all, I've always, I, I, I've had feeling everybody I've ever let go. I should have let them go sooner. I should have let them go at the second that I knew they needed to go, but you get scared, you know, and you don't know what the community is going to say. You don't know how they're going to react. You don't know, you know, and Idaho's an at will state. I'm in an out a, What's it called? Now I'm there in at will state. Am I saying that right? Um, yeah. And you can fire somebody whenever you want and they can quit whenever you want without, without, um, without cause, without reason. And you can let them go and you need to, that's for Idaho. You need to let them go. If you're in California, good luck with that, but you need to let them go when you know they need to go because they feel it. You feel it. Everybody knows it. And the problem is you lose confidence with your staff. Your staff is going to now start questioning you and they're going to start wondering why you're keeping this person on staff when you know that you have counseled them. And I know that the, this one girl that I knew and need to let go, she, I counseled her for a year. I gave her a year chance after chance after chance to make it right and to change. And she just didn't. And she continued to lie and she continued to uh, just skirt the rules and it just became so terrible, but I kept her on because I didn't want to face the wrath of her family member. And so finally, I just had to bite the bullet and do it. Um, and you, when you get that feeling that someone is unhappy, let them go because, or, you know, if you want to have that talk with them and saying, Hey, I, I know you're, are you unhappy? What do I need? And I do have this talk with my staff, my current staff now on a regular basis. I try to be much more sensitive to their needs. I try to say, how is everybody feeling? Does anybody need a break? Are you guys all mentally doing okay? Is there something I can do for you to make this easier? Um, is everybody happy with their pay? Are you happy with your hours? I do not micromanage my staff. The way that we have things organized with Code Red, they work in their shifts. They're allowed to change shifts. They're allowed to swap things out. They're allowed to sub for each other. They take off time when they need it. I will sub for them. It's a very much done on the honor system and the work gets done. And the, the staff is appreciated and they get paid well for it. And I don't, I'm not in their business. And so I can only do what I can do. And I try to keep up, you know, uh, we just recently switched from having, we used to have meetings on zoom every other week, but the problem was we were going through so many things that we needed to talk about that people were forgetting. So I started, instead of having meetings, just putting it all in an email. 
and then they needed to reply got it once they read the email and we don't have the staff meetings anymore but i wonder if that is because we're not together we're not seeing each other and i'm wondering um i'm hoping that's not splitting us all apart it's better for the company because it's better that we that they read and they can see in bullet points what we're doing but i worry that they feel disconnected from each other and so I don't know. I'm sure, you know, I make mistakes constantly and I'm always pivoting and I'm always trying to do things better, but I'm telling you the second that you feel like an employee needs to go, you need to get rid of them. Don't keep that. Don't drag that thing out because you're worried about what someone else might think, or you're worried about what the community might think, or you're worried about like uh, at the end of the day, everybody's going to be fine. They'll get past it and you got to do what's right for your company. So definitely my second thing is first thing is don't hire family members. Second thing is, is you need to hire, you need to fire people faster. Don't drag crap on. I, I would, I would tell myself, let them go at the second that you knew in your gut, they needed to go, let them go, let them go. And the third thing I would do if I was doing this over again is I would be more polarizing. I would lean into controversy more. And, you know, you get caught up with social media and this is the age of social media. Uh, you get caught up in the likes and the follows and you get caught up in the comments and you get caught up in losing likes and losing follows and, or not losing likes, but losing followers and, and in losing engagement and, you know, just social media just screws with your head. It's one of my top three biggest tips on how I went from food stands to 10 million is I use social media and I think you should use social media, um, but just use it as a tool. It shouldn't be the only tool. Just use it as a tool because they are free platforms and it's a great way to meet, to reach people. I mean, you think of the, um, um, Clea and Joanna from the home edit, they own, they own the home edit, which is that organizing company out of Nashville and they're, they're, they're nationwide and they grew their, they grew their company from social media alone. They never ran any ads. And then they got the Netflix special, of course, now that they just blew up during 2020 and stuff, but they're huge now they're huge. And it was just done from social media. So you can do a lot from social media, but we put too much stock into it sometimes. And you understand that like, even if it's even bad attention is still attention. You're getting eyeballs on things. And on April 1st of 2024, I posted a post about uh, a couple in the airport that were um, very, very sick very metabolically broken, very sick, overweight, had some muscular skeletal deformities. You could see they had um, arthritis. They had pitting edema in their legs. They were both overweight. They both had thinning hair. They both had skin deformities. They both had glasses. I mean, they both had a hump in their back and they were eating garbage, just absolute garbage junk food. So although I blocked their faces, I posted the, a picture of them, of what they were eating. And I described how, what they were eating were feeding into these different diseases that they had. Well, it was taken way wrong. And I was called a fat shamer. Well, that was one of the best things that ever happened to me. I mean, seriously, because I mean, the, the attention I got from that, it was wrong. I mean, you guys saw that, that I did a, I did a podcast that night called, is it fat shaming? And I posted it the very next morning. It's not fat shaming. I did not I reveal their identity and I'll stand behind that to the day I die. And I'm getting ready to start a series called, is it fat shaming? And I'm going to talk about different things like our FDA board of directors. Every single one of them is, is, is obese. And these people are making your health decisions. Is that fat shaming that I bring that up? And some of you guys, no, of course it's not. They're making our health decisions. Oh, oh, so that's okay. You know, is it fat shaming that you see obese people in B-roll of films? No, that's not fat shaming because I because you're blocking their face. I blocked these people's face, but I got called a fat shamer. So I would lean into controversy even harder if I was starting over. I would be more polarizing. I would be way more vocal about the things that get people canceled. I would try to get myself canceled. I would really come on strong because that's how people make history. That's how people get noticed. That's how people make, uh, you got to make noise. You can't blend in in a very saturated industry like weight, like weight loss. And I'm not saying you should call people names or I'm not saying you should fat shame. I don't think it's fat shaming. We are in a crisis now. We're almost nine out of 10 people are overweight. 
and almost five out of 10 are obese. We are at a crisis where one in 10 kids has diabetes, juvenile diabetes. This is not good, type two diabetes. We are in a serious, serious problem. I think that some people need to say the hard things. And if I were doing it over again, I would say the quiet thing. I would say the thing that people don't say. I would step out and I would say, no, someone's got to say this. This is not okay. This is child abuse. No, it's not okay that we, that we feed ourselves this. It's not okay that we glorify being fat. It's not okay that we, that we give people free airline seats because they're too fat. They don't want to buy two seats. It's not okay that I, I just, I'm not going to, I would lean into that harder if I were doing it over again. And I would not be afraid of what would happen to me. See, you don't realize guys, I am willing to risk everything for this cause. I am willing to lose everything. I have lost family members. I'm willing to lose every single family member that I've ever, every single one. I'm willing to lose all of my assets, all of my money, my houses, my car, everything I own. I will sleep under a bridge if that's what it takes to advance this message. That's how much I want this message to go forth and to have a voice, the message of hope and healing. And you might not like my method of doing it. You might, you might not have, but you're also the same person that's hiding in the shadows, not doing anything with your life. I'm willing to risk everything and I will stop at nothing. And I would lean into that even harder if I were doing it over again. If I, you know, if I were starting over, I mean, remember I, I met Natasha when I was 40 years old, it was my 40th birthday. She came into my office two weeks into her program. She said, you have something that's incredible here. You, the world needs to hear what you have to say. And you have a multi-million dollar company. And she turned things around. If I were starting back, if I was 40 again, shoot, I would be the loudest, most obnoxious. And I'm getting loud and obnoxious more and more all the time. But I would get loud, louder and louder and louder about the truth. People need to hear the truth. And I would be more polarizing. I would. I would be much more in your face. And I don't think you need to fat shame, but people need to hear the truth, especially in this time of crisis when obesity is killing more people than drugs and alcohol combined. But we are so fat phobic in this, or we are so fat friendly in this society. And we're being called, everybody wants to call people a fat shamer. It's easy to call people a fat shamer, isn't it? Other than you take your responsibility for your own, your own poor health. You'd rather just call someone a fat shamer and hide behind that. Yeah. Yeah. I, I get it. Well, I will be that person. I'm willing to die on this sword. You don't realize it. I'll risk all of it hundred percent. And if I was sitting in that office again at 40 years old, and I realized back then what I know now, I would lean in hard. I would be as polarizing as I could. And that's what gets noticed. You know, um, you might be the most hated person on the planet, but when it comes down to the brass tacks, I mean, the problem is we are really, really sick in this society. We got a serious problem in, in, in the, the system is just waiting for your surrender. You are surrendering to the system. You are surrendering to big pharma. You are surrendering to the government, the government, just like on that movie, Wally, -E, the government loves the fact that you're getting bigger and bigger and you need more pharmaceuticals and you need more food and you are hooked to their product and you are hooked to the screens and you are hooked on porn and you are hooked to the sugar and you are hooked on the alcohol and you are hooked on the diet Coke. That's what the system wants. And nobody wants to say it for fear of getting canceled. I don't have the fear anymore of getting canceled, losing followers. I do not care. I will always rise above. And I wish I had this courage eight years ago. Because what is it? Well-behaved women rarely make history. <laughs> Those are my thought, my top three things that I would change if I were to start code red over again, I wouldn't hire a family. I would be quicker to let toxic people go and I would be more in your face. I'd be more polarizing. I would say the quiet thing that nobody wants to say right or wrong. I would live my truth.
right or wrong in your eyes. I would live my truth. People come to me when they're serious. People come to me when they're sick of being BS because all these other weight loss industries, they want you to keep buying their product. I do not because I don't have a product to sell. I'm teaching you about real food, water, and sleep. No shakes, no pills, no diet foods, no exercise. You don't need any of those things in order to lose weight with real food, water, and sleep. So you don't have to keep buying my product. What product? What product? What magnesium? Ooh, you're probably not getting enough mag. I, here, I got a great quality mag. Take it if you want it. But to lose weight, it's real food, water, and sleep. I can lay my head down at night with what I have done with my life. And I would just 10 exit if I could start it over again. I would. So whether you cared for this podcast or you just kind of like, not really my thing, Christy, you know, I don't know. It's not everybody's, it might not be for you, but, um, those are my three things that I would definitely change. And maybe you'll learn from this and maybe you'll just chalk it up to another one of Christy's podcasts, but either way, thank you for listening and I'll see you on the next one. Thank you so much for listening to Rebel Weight Loss and Lifestyle. If you are looking for some hardcore accountability to get and keep this weight off, look no further because I've got VIP connection. This is the ultimate connection to me just short of me sleeping on your couch. You're going to get three daily messages from me in real time directly to you. You're going to submit your weight every Friday. We're going to go over it in a weekly meeting on Sunday nights, and I'm going to give you feedback. You'll have access to a monthly VIP breakfast with me and Boise, a monthly VIP supplement box, access to any workshop, any PDF promo that I hold for that month. You'll have access to the ringside membership. And best of all, you'll have a fully customized nutrition program written just for you. We're talking about over $3,000 total value for $3.97 a month, and you can cancel any time. Go to coderedlifestyle.com forward slash VIP to check that out.